Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for being with us this day and all of our different activities. Thank you for allowing us to come tonight, study your word and to be blessed and get a blessing from reading your word. Uh, please send us your Holy Spirit now and help us to feel your presence and help us to all uh, learn something new and to gain everything that you want us to out of this study. Be with yes. everyone listening in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thanks, Lori. You're welcome. Well, welcome, everyone. We're, we're at <laughs> Revelation 21. It seems like we just started this trek uh, a short period of time ago, but actually it's been almost 10 months. Mm -hmm. Just a few, it will be when we're done, a few weeks short of 10 months, I think Eddie said uh, last mm -hmm. evening. So we are at Revelation 21, and this is really an exciting chapter in, in the book of Revelation. The difficulties of the last yeah. chapters are behind us, and, and now we get to see the new Jerusalem and the new heaven and the new earth and boy what a day that will be when we get to see that so the we see the new heaven new heavens and the new earth and then we also see this holy city the new jerusalem this was an exciting chapter in the book of revelation um we've traveled a long road from daniel chapter one to revelation 21 and we're soon to celebrate the completion of an amazing journey together. We hope that you found the study beneficial. You know, I've learned how the writings of many of the Jewish prophets intertwine with each other in Revelation. And I understand how Daniel must be the precursor of Revelation if one wants to understand the book of Revelation. How about you? Is there anything that stands out to you from this study that you've seen here? that you've made with us? And that's a rhetorical question. Um, think about that. What things have you gained from this study of Daniel and Revelation that you didn't learn before, that you didn't know before? Our journey has been like a long TV series, one with many difficult, epi different episodes, but most depicting rebellious actors doing despicable things. It, it's like a difficult war movie with lots of well-choreographed scenes of fighting some to victory and others to defeat. Now, though, we're at the place where we see that after all the previous ep episodes, we find that the good guys win. And that's mm -hmm. exciting. And like a home tour on Zillow, for use of those of you that have looked at Zillow and, and maybe looked at homes on that uh, website, you're going you're gonna to get to see the new place you will live once the old heavens and earth are destroyed with fire and the new Jerusalem arrives, the <laughs> earth in its place. Does the ending sound too good to be true? Believe it. It's one of God's promises for us. In uh, 2 Peter 3.13, Peter says, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So, that's the place that we're looking forward to, and that's what's going to be described here in this chapter of Revelation. Charlie, just to, I'm a Charlie. Larry, quick note. Yeah. Uh, the new heaven, the new earth is not just a New Testament uh, teaching. Uh, Isaiah talked about it a few times. In fact, he talks about it, I think, more than uh, more than Peter and John. Yes, and you will see that here as we uh, go further into the study. Uh, would someone like to read uh, Revelation 21 and 22 for us? 21 and uh, verses 1 and 2, rather. Please. I'll read it. Um, <clears throat> now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first earth and the first, uh, first heaven and first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. All right. Thanks, mm -hmm. Eddie. Mm -hmm. Remember that the earth has been destroyed by fire. Everything is destroyed to include the elements. There's nothing left. Now Jesus introduces John to a new heaven and a new earth within view. Those who love the ocean may read this and think this would be awful, but 
John is just saying that the old sea was destroyed with the elements of the earth. So if we go to Zechariah 9, 9 through 10, uh, Zechariah mentions here from sea to sea, he says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, a foal of the donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off. He shall speak peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. So the thought with Revelation 21.1 is that uh, with that statement, there will be no more sea is probably metaphoric. Hmm. The sea represents uh, the metaphor of the sea is uh, the sea represents disturbed and stormy social and political conditions out of which tyrannies arise for uh, Renko Stefanovic. It was out of the sea that the best oppressing the beast oppressing God's people comes in Revelation. So no more sea means there will be no more strife or tyranny like that brought about by the beast. You know, I, I, we thought about this last night, and I think that from a personal standpoint, you have John also, he's in forced separation because of the sea, right? He's on the island of Patmos. And, and that separation is something that God is really trying to really all about overcoming right it's, mm -hmm. you know, we are separated from him now because of sin and in essence that's the sea right that separates us and that's going to be all gone right so yeah. i think john yeah. has a little bit of that in that too yeah makes sense yeah <laughs> and then the heavens you know uh paul mentions the third heaven and uh i want to talk about the heavens here for a moment so the first heaven is the atmospheric heaven where the birds fly. So it's the atmosphere, the clouds, the sky. That is the first heaven. The second heaven is the heaven where the planets reside, the region of the sun and the moon and the stars and, and all of that. And then the third heaven, it must be high above the others and out of you where paradise and the tree of life are found. God resides in the third heaven on his throne. Now, this is the heaven that Paul was caught up in with his heavenly vision in 2 Corinthians 12. He says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows such a one was caught up to the third heaven. Well, we believe that Paul was writing about himself, mm -hmm. but didn't want to brag, so he didn't mention himself as being the one that was uh called up to the third heaven um there this is where christ ascended when he left the earth and where now as a priest king sits upon the throne with his father let's look at revelation 12 5 and zachariah 6 13. she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron and her child was caught up to god and his throne of course, the child being the Christ child himself uh, ascended into heaven uh, as our high priest. And then Zechariah says, yes, he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory and he shall sit and rule on his throne. So he shall be a priest on his throne and the council of peace shall be between them both. And then uh, the heaven is where the glorious uh, city stands, awaiting the saints when they enter into eternal life, as we read a little bit ago. And here uh, we are at Revelation 21, 2 through 4. Uh, who would like to read that for us? I can read it. Oh, okay. go ahead. Go ahead. Just, oh, go ahead. oh, you go ahead. I didn't want to take it away from you, no. but I'll, I'll do it. Uh, then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. 
and I heard a loud voice from heaven, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Thanks, Shirley. Amen. So the description of the new Jerusalem, what, what does it look like to you? Verse 2 gives you a simile, you know, a word visual of the new Jer Jerusalem. What do those words describe to you? I, you know, this new Jerusalem here, look at it, it's talking about being the tabernacle. And we might want to spend some time, Larry, looking at the tabernacle that was on earth to oh, really get sort of a picture on this. We'll do that. But, but yeah, I mean, this, that's, this is God answering his stated purpose all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, bringing reunion back with his people, where yeah. we have been separated. We live in a world of death, sorrow, anxiety, fear, and he is bringing us back into a world that's based upon love and love and more love. Yeah, well, good. I, I agree. Thank you. And what about the bride? So um, we talked about that last night that uh, the groom has prepared uh, for this wedding, has prepared the bride for this wedding. And now the bride, think of a bride, uh, think of a wedding that you've been to and the bride is at the back of the church and she's about to walk down the aisle and and how does she look? She's adorned in white like this beautiful city. Uh, she's pure. She's perfect. She's beautiful. She's undefiled. It reminds me that we, the church, are the bride of Christ as well. So <clears throat> we in the New Jerusalem are the bride of Christ. And then that tabernacle that he mentions here that Charlie mentions, the tabernacle. So what was that again? We know that the tabernacle was where God resided when the Jews were in the wilderness. And did you know that a tabernacle can also be a dwelling place? And I found that on one of the Merriam-Webster definitions. One of the definitions was a dwelling place. We know that the tabernacle was a dwelling place of God in the wilderness. And they shall be his people, he says. So... I will be their God and they will be my people as mentioned 43 times in the Bible. And here's just a few, uh, second Corinthians six sixteen, or what agreement has the temple of God with, with idols? We, for we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And in Jeremiah 32, 38, he says, they shall be my people and I will be their God. And of course, Hebrews 8, 10, for this is a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and I will write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. He's speaking of us, of course. So, um, we have shed tears for those family and friends whose names were not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. When we arrive there and we look around and realize that though, there are those that we love that are missing. But, you know, God will dry those tears from our eyes. There will be no more death. Remember, death was thrown into the lake of fire in the last chapter of Revelation. There will be no sorrow, no pain, no sin, and only love, as Charlie said. Life on earth has not been easy for any of us. Let's face it. We have had pain. We have seen death more times than we want to think about. And we have wept over lost loved ones and friends. We have yielded to temptations and plans were destroyed. Maybe hunger and lack of shelter were an issue in our lives at some point. All of that will be gone and not be remembered anymore. This is our father's house that Jesus spoke about in John 14. 
The place that Jesus said he would prepare is a place for us to reside with him, his father and the saints. If your name is in the Lamb's book of life, this will be your home also. Yeah, amen. Yeah. I like it. Amen. I do too. Amen. And then the words of Jesus from John 14, he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. So the place has been prepared for us, the bride of Christ, his church, the new Jerusalem, is our new home. Ah, and that tabernacle that Charlie mentioned. Well, we need to talk about the tabernacle here for just a second, and I won't be take too long, but this is the parts of the tabernacle. So this is the outer court, and this is the altar of burnt offerings where uh, burnt offerings and sacrifices took place. <laughs> this is a lavir, and what this is is the water that the priests used to wash their hands and their feet to prepare them for their priestly duties. Now, uh, that's the outer courtyard. Now we go into the uh, tabernacle inside itself to the holy place. And when we walk in, we see to the right, there's a table of showbread. And each cake or loaf had about four quarts of fine flour in it. And every Sabbath day, hot loaves were placed on the table and two rows of six each. In the past week's uh, loaves were eaten by the priest uh, and, and the place was set aside uh, as holy. Across from that table showbread is the menorah and of course that is the the candelabra if you will with all the candles on it all the lights that are part of it as well and then the altar of incense is where um, the uh, incense and the censors and all of that were, and that's where uh, incense was burned. And then we have the Holy of Holies, which is the most holy place, and it's separated by a curtain. Now, this curtain or veil, they call it, was some 60 feet tall, and Jewish tradition says that it was four inches thick and made of fine fabric. And this is the curtain that was torn from top to bottom when Christ um, breathed his last breath from the cross. And it separated uh, everyone else and every other part of that tabernacle from uh, the Holy of Holies and the Ark of the Covenant and the Mercy Seat. Of course, in the Ark of, Co of the Covenant would have been the Ten Commandments. Also, there would have been a, uh, a jar of memorial jar of manna in Aaron's rod that budded. And then on the side of the ark, there was a copy of uh, writings of Moses. And then the mercy seat, of course, is the lid of the ark of the covenant. And it was covered by two cherubim, one on each side. Their wings were covering the mercy seat. And it's the place of appeasement and reconciliation, of atonement and of mercy and of pardon of covering it is exactly the, is exactly the top of the ark. So that is the old tabernacle. And of course, the temple uh, took the same form as the tabernacle. And what are your questions on that? Well, isn't that something? It is. I mean, yeah, yeah that's actually the plan of salvation, uh, 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 which was a shadow of uh, the life of uh, sacrifice of, and ministry of Christ. Uh, and uh, it's a, a great diagram to study as it relates to the plan of salvation. Yeah, I, I heard some people talking this week and they said, mm -hmm. you know, when Jesus was a 12 year old boy, you know, he spent some time at the temple. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and if you watch, as you watch the service, and watch what was going on, the sacrifices and the priest's actions. He actually saw himself, you know, what he would be doing. Yeah. So, I mean, 
Jesus was fully God, but he was a boy too, right? And he was mm -hmm. learning. And he saw yeah. somewhere in his mind, go, oh, that's me. Mm -hmm. yeah. I am the, I'm the Lamb of God. You know, I, it's a good point, Charlie. The, the context <clears throat> of the tabernacle, why, why I think Larry brought this up, is the fact that tabernacle is where God dwelt with the children of Israel out in the desert. <clears throat> it was his dwelling place. And there will be no need of a temple, and I think you'll get to that later. But the fact is, uh, God has promised to dwell with us. And uh, this is just a, uh, a shadow of the dwelling of God with his people. Yes. Thank you very yeah. much. Right. And then we have uh, Revelation 21, 5 and 6. And uh, Lori, would you like to read these? Yes, I will. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. Yes. Thank Do you want me to read the bottom part? Or? Oh, no, that's okay. Thank you. It's just kind of a summary of what he said. So his promises are complete, and um, he's the beginning and the end, and the fountain of living water is given to all who thirst for all of us. You know, in 2 Peter 3.13, Peter says, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. His words are faithful and true, uh, promises complete, as I uh, mentioned here just a moment ago. And he, he calls himself the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Why would Jesus call himself that? I like, I like the thing which I've heard Eddie say before, was is that uh, uh, if we take the alphabet and go A to Z, that that covers it, right? There's nothing, yeah. there's nothing else, right? It's no. cool. He's all in all. He's everything. Yeah. yeah. And he's eternal, you know. Right. Has no beginning and no end. That's well, right. and, 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 you know, when we think about humans, we, we can hardly ever be at both places at once, the beginning and the end. Mm -hmm. This is telling us that God can be and is. Yeah. And will be. <laughs> he's yeah. Places, so. He was there at the creation. Right of the world, of the heavens, of, of everything. And he's going to be there at the end and the new beginning, which is exciting. So the Alpha and the Omega. And then the fountain of water of life that Jesus mentions as well. Here it's mentioned in John 4, uh, in a couple of uh, verses, Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gifts of God and who it is that uh, who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And of course, we know that Jesus is talking mm -hmm. to the woman at the well in the parable. Mm -hmm. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into eternal life. And now that water has been given has given us that eternal life that Jesus has promised. That's what's described here in Revelation 21. Wow. Also in John 7, he says, On that last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of the heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, Who's, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Yeah. And that's something because this here, here we're talking about Jesus who, since he took on our form, man's form, right? He was rather limited in where he could be at all times. But the Holy Spirit wasn't. And so basically yeah. he's saying, here, I'm giving you something better. Because I can't be everywhere. Yeah, he has the same heart I have. He has the same love for you, but he can be with you all the time, so that uh, so that we're not really left 
uh, left in the lurch because he was going. In fact, we were given right. more, something, something more. So Good. pretty amazing. Yes, definitely. And now we have uh, Revelation 21, 7 and 8. Uh, Charlie, would you like to read these? Please? Oh, yeah. Now, this is, I love the word inherit. Well, I'm going to talk about that. <laughs> he overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Ooh, okay. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, here's a scary thing. Uh, if I look at verse 8, I'm going, uh, you know, the, it's a, if I just look at the book of my works, yeah, I could find myself in verse eight. Yes, <laughs> but couldn't we all? Lord, praise the Lord, we yeah. have the spirit of sonship. Yes, uh, and God looks at Jesus, and we have that inheritance. You know, you can only inherit something if you're related. Uh, you know, that's that's it. And we are now. He basically remember when Jesus said, "I call you my brother." You know, you're no longer servants, right? You know, here yeah. we are, we're related. He's basically making we're related to him. And thus, where it can get his, his inheritance is natural. Right. right. So the, the word cowardly is kind of unusual. Yeah, I like to highlight cowardly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it has to be in the context, though, of <clears throat> the experience of faith. And maybe you're going to say something about that. Yeah, I'm definitely going to talk <laughs> about that. Because it's kind of, uh, it, yeah. it's, uh, well, unbelieving and cowardly, yes. Mm -hmm. But if we look at all the others who are not going to be, um, who's uh, who are not going to be part of the inheritance. Those that don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that He died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, and their names aren't written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But inherit all things. You know, our inheritance is the kingdom of God on the new earth, where there lives only righteousness. That's what our inheritance is going to be. And I'll be his God, and he shall be my son. So our adoption is complete, and we have received our wonderful inheritance, eternal life with the Lord. And then uh, let's look at... Uh, no, I, I, think, I think Lori was going to say something like that. She, she, oh, sorry. Uh, oh, no. I, no, I just said amen. I, oh, I'm, oh a okay. Wonderful thought. Yes, that's amen. for sure. And you know, uh, uh, that word, uh, cowardly, Think of it. Remember, this is the people that are unbelieving, that are lost. And uh, you know how many times God tells us to not be afraid? <laughs> I mean, yeah. uh, I, do not. I think there's about, I, I just quickly, just using do not be afraid, I find 16 times. Wow. And uh, and really, the, the life of faith, isn't it one of assurance that God has heard your prayer? And he will respond according to his will. Yeah, that's right. That's a life of faith. Mm -hmm. So um, basically I, what I'm hearing you say, Eddie, is that fear when facing adversity is, is a, actually an act of non-belief, right? It, yeah. It's also a fear of God not answering your prayer the way oh, yeah. you want him to answer it. <laughs> well, I mean, actually, you know, when, we, when I think about being afraid of God, yeah, it is actually Satan being very good at misrepresenting God to us. Yeah, and unfortunately, we being having that sinful nature, we're more than willing to use our evil and then project it upon an all powerful God. How terrible is that? Yeah. You know, if I was God all of a sudden with, with a sinful nature, that would be terrible. I would mm -hmm. have now all, all this power to do evil with, right? Right, I'd call it good, but mm -hmm. I would still be getting you know. Only God yeah. can really know how to handle all that power and love at the same time. So, yeah. So, he who overcomes, uh, we we've seen this before. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To to him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So we we must overcome the obstacles and temptations that. Satan throws in our path in our daily lives. 
but it's our faith and belief in Christ that will allow us to overcome. So um, let's also look at uh, Romans 4, 13 and, and Galatians 3, 26 through 29. Would someone like to read those? Eddie, would you read these? Yeah, um, Romans 4, 13, for the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Good one. Galatians 3, 26 to 29. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as of you who were baptized unto Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So Amen. you're Jewish if you're in Christ. <laughs> yes. So we are, we are, we are part of that. Uh, we are the seed of Abraham, even though we aren't part of that bloodline. And we're heir to all those promises that he gave to Israel. That's right. Yes. What a great inheritance yeah. for being only adopted. Mm -hmm. And then we let's talk about that cowardly because you had a discussion about cowardly. But, you know, Smith uh, brought up some uh, great ideas about cowardly. He said uh, the cowardly, those who fear or what, of what fear then does John speak? And Smith says that it is a fear connected with unbelief. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. A fear of ridicule and opposition of the world. That's, that's one we have to be concerned about for ourselves. Are we fearful of the ridicule and opposition of those that we share the gospel with? We're going to, we're going to meet opposition to the gospel and we we can't fear that and and stand back and let uh and not be disciple makers is what he's saying so a fear to trust god and venture out upon his his promises and i think that's what you all were saying earlier mm -hmm. a fear that he will not fulfill what he has declared and why would we ever have that fear because he's done everything he promised thus far and that consequently, we shall be left to shame and loss for believing on him. Cherishing such fear, one can only half-hearted be half-hearted in his service. This is the most dishonoring to God. This is the fear which we are commanded not to have. And then uh, Isaiah mentions fear as well. He says here in the 51.7, listen to me, you who know righteousness. You people in whose heart is my law, do not fear the reproach of men. Do not be afraid of their insults. Don't, don't be afraid of their, the criticism of men. They're going to criticize us. But, and don't be afraid of their insults. Now, we, we don't need to fear man. No. No. Well, but that's, this is the deal. I mean, we're saying this like, we look like we've never feared man, and yet we all... We all have this thing, right? Uh, you know, and God, ta God often taps us on the shoulder and says, "Hey, go do this. Go say this to someone." And we we have that resistance going. Oh, I don't want to, I don't want to appear to be uh, pushy, or I don't want to, you know, open myself up to other criticism. And yeah, uh, you know, and sometimes you sort of laugh that you know when the disciples went out and they were tapped on the shoulder, they were putting themselves up for being beheaded or crucified. Yeah, or right. Like that. And, so, and yeah. we, I mean, we can remember God needs, God needs to give us this, you know, this 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 uh, strength and, and courage, because yeah. naturally we, we we try to hide from that sort of thing. So yeah, yeah, I agree. And there was that fellow named Noah. Yeah. Oh, no, not Noah, Jonah. Oh yeah, Jonah, even Jonah, yeah. Jonah, 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 go to Nineveh. Uh, and he went the other way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> went to Joppa. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Boy, that was uh, that's what that reminded me of. Um, let's see here, uh, Lori. I think you're up, huh? Okay. All right. Uh, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the last seven plagues came to me and talked with me, saying, "Come, I will show you the bride, 
the Lamb's wife. Okay, thanks, Lori. So the New Jerusalem is described here as the Lamb's wife, which is a departure from other descriptions and revelations so far. And we talked about this a moment ago. The church has been described as the Bride of Christ. So how can the New Jerusalem be described as the Bride? Well, um, what do you think? Well, the New Jerusalem, um, in, in the context of what we're reading here, uh, contains, you know, when we talk about a bride, we usually see the senior here, but the bride is, is the church, the followers, it's a multitude of people, and that multitude of people are in this uh, New Jerusalem that's coming down out of heaven, and uh, she's prepared as a, as a bride, and I think that's probably uh, what we're talking about here. Well, I find that the this the the this brideship and wedding wedding terminology is all throughout you know <clears throat> the relationship with Jesus and especially in the second coming. Yeah. Uh, I think it, I think it's interesting you pointed out that you know it's the bride is it's the groom in this case who's prepared the uh, the bride the, the new no prepared the new Jerusalem. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Right. And 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 it's adorned for who? Well, it's adorned for oh, the other bride, right? Which is mm -hmm. which is the body of Christ, right? Who's you know, yeah. so, you know, I, I Gloria, you were once a bride. <laughs> <laughs> I was never a bride. But you know, I know that uh brides tend to do a lot to make themselves the most specialist on their wedding day, right? And yeah. and that's what I'm thinking. What God is trying to say here: when we see the New Jerusalem, we're going to go, "Wow, wow!" Just like mm -hmm. I did when I saw my wife coming down the aisle. Like, wow, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, so yeah. he's taking that. He's and that's very meticulous, right? You don't you don't put it in hands of, of people who are going to be careless, right? You don't, you don't do that. You find the best, and you have them do the best stuff, the best, make it look the best. And so that's why we know the New Jerusalem isn't isn't a last minute Christmas gift from Walmart. It, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, this one is planned. The all the it's just for us, right? It's not for anyone else. It's just like, like you know, it's just for us. He's made it just for us, and he's planned it, and he's made it beautiful, and it's going to be wow. I'm going to say wow again. It's going to be wow. To <laughs> me, the, one of the most uh, uh, precious points of a wedding is found in that picture right in the center of this slide here yeah. is when the bride and the groom look at each other. And uh, that's going to be the exciting part of this experience is to be able to look into the face of Christ, each person who is the bride and he is the, the singular groom. We're the multitude of bride, but we'll be able to see uh, you know, like that passage says, now we look through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Yeah. Oh, I look forward to that day. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Isaiah talks about uh, about the bride and uh, and the husband here in Isaiah 54. He says, do not fear for you will not be ashamed neither be disgraced, for you will not be put to shame, for you will forget the shame of your youth and will not remember the reproach of your widowhood anymore. For your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and your redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. He is called the God of the whole earth, for the Lord has called you like a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, like a youthful wife when you were refused, says your God. And Smith says of the, the new covenant city is brought into view. He says it represented, it's represented as being desolate with the old covenant when the old covenant was enforced. And the Jews in the old Jerusalem were the special objects of God's care. But it is said to her that children of the desolate shall be many more than children of the married wife. It is further said to her, thy maker is thy husband, and the closing promise of the Lord to this city in Isaiah 54 contains a very similar description to the one which we have here in Revelation. Namely, I will lay thy stones with fair colors and lay thy foundations with sapphires. 
and I will make the windows of agates and thy gates of carbuncles and all thy borders of pleasant stones and all thy children shall be taught of the Lord. Yes, good. And then in Galatians 4, 26, but the Jerusalem that is above is free and she is our mother for it is written, be glad, barren woman, you who never bore a child, shout for joy and cry aloud, you who were never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who was a husband. Uh, uh, than her who has a husband. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Paul speaks of Jerusalem of above as being our mother. Oh, the city is a mother of the church and the Lord's bride. And we are in Christ. We in Christ are the guests to the marriage supper. And then Paul quotes, of course, from Isaiah 54, 1, here in uh, the in Galatians. And then in Matthew uh, 22, 1 and 2, Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. So that's the beginning of the next chapter here in Revelation. But this view is that the marriage of the Lamb is the inaugurate inauguration of christ as a king upon the throne of david and then the course of parables that are here in matthew uh, 22 1 and 2 and also uh, the parables about the wedding feast that you see in luke and matthew uh, they apply to that event is further confirmed by a well-known ancient custom it is said that when a person took a position as ruler over the people and was invested with the power it was called a marriage, and usually accompanying feast was called a marriage supper. So, the marriage supper. Yeah, wow. All and, right. And in, the, 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 in, in Jesus' parable, we got to be careful to come in his garments, not in our garments. Yes, that's right. Because there was one in, uh, in the parable in Luke where he... Uh, was somehow there in the wedding at the wedding feast, but noticed that he was uh, the Lord noticed that he wasn't dressed for the occasion, and uh, that's a scary thought. That uh, he asked the question, "Friend, how did you get in here?" And then how he was yeah, no excuse. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, the look on his face was probably uh, fright, frightened, fearful. Well, I, I mean, he had no excuse because the the gift of jesus's righteousness thus the wedding garment was free and delivered yeah. to him yeah you know it was a fact that he rejected jesus's righteousness and yet still wanted to go into the wedding feast. yeah wearing his own garments well, yeah his own righteousness and yeah. you know this is what we saw in revelation 20 you know hold it your name is not written in the Lamb's Book of Life because you're no. not wearing the right garment here. <laughs> That's right. Oops. Uh, our righteousness is like that of filthy rags. Didn't Paul say that? Uh, Isaiah. Know, what's that? Yeah, Isaiah. That's right. Isaiah. Yeah. yeah. So uh, he arrived in filthy rags and uh, he was noticed. Yeah. Eddie, would you read uh, Revelation 21, 10 through 14? Sure. <clears throat> And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven for God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Also, she had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates and names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. Now the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Thanks, Eddie. Twelves. <laughs> Lots of twelves, that's right. And isn't it interesting that the foundations, the foundation is the 12 apostles, but with uh, yes. the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So it is a Christian city. And how do we know that? Because of that foundation. But the gates were named for the 12 tribes of Israel. 
Now, we're going to see here in just a moment uh, what those uh, gates were made of. But first, the children of Israel is explained further here in Romans and Galatians. It's, it is not as though God's word had failed, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. Hmm. But because they are his descendants, are they all Abraham's children? On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded, regarded as Abraham's offspring. This is further to what we read a little bit earlier. And then, of course, in Galatians 3.29, uh, Paul says again, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So the answer, that answer is the question about the 12 tribes and who are also Abraham's offspring. And mm -hmm. we see a second time in this review, this is the second time in the review of this chapter. Okay, and now we're going to be talking about this huge city. And uh, I'll read this one. And he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city its gates and its wall. The city is laid out as a square, its length as, is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. Then he measured its walls, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of an angel. The construction of its wall was of jasper. The city was pure gold, like clear glass. This city is going to be huge, and it's a perfect cube. And the city is laid out in a, uh, in a perfect square, so measuring equally on all sides. And John said it was 1,400 miles per side, so uh, 12,000 furlongs uh, translated into miles is 1,400 miles. Yeah. And, uh, of course, as I mentioned, the height's the same. So the walls are of precious, of precious stone. Jasper, according to verse 11, clear as gap, glass. City is, the city is pure gold and shines like clear glass. Have you ever seen something gold polished to the point that it just reflected like glass? And I guess we have. I, I, I haven't seen anything quite that shiny. I've seen brass that was shiny, similar to that. Hey, one other thing, the 44 cubits, the wall height. Yes. That comes up to 216 feet. 216 feet thick. Yeah, or tall. Tall. Yeah. Okay. So then, uh, yeah, that's, that's very tall. So the city walls... Uh, why would we have city walls in this place where only righteousness resides? Because sin and evil have been destroyed. They were thrown in the lake of fire. Any ideas? Have, we're not going to have big armies attacking. Nope. It's, it's, for, it's just for the feeling of our security. That's what yeah. Stavonovic said. Yeah, and you know, <clears throat> our... A lot of people don't realize this. We think that heaven is our home, but um, and uh, even the New Jerusalem isn't necessarily our home, although we'll probably have apartments there. Uh, it's the new earth that the meek inherit. Remember, Jesus said the meek shall inherit the earth. Yeah. So um, I like the, the way it's put in Isaiah that we will build houses and have vineyards and enjoy the works of our hands so it's like we'll have a country home and a city home yeah <laughs> yes oh that's what a joyful time that will be yeah and now you know the foundations uh the, here are described further so the foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones the first foundation was jasper the second was sapphire the third was Chalcedony, the fourth was Emerald, and the fifth was Sardonyx, the sixth Sardius, the seventh was Chrysolite, the eighth was Beryl, the ninth Topaz, the tenth was Chrysophrase, 
and the eleventh was jacinth, and finally the twelfth was amethyst. So some say that this new Jerusalem described in Revelation here with the stones is metaphorical rather than literal, but Smith disagrees, and so do I. He says that it should not be looked at that way. The foundations of this new Jerusalem will be of precious stones, as described here. What are your thoughts on that? I have, I'm just amazed at the, what John was seeing, and uh, I'm not sure. It's one of those things where I know he was seeing something that he had difficulty explaining. Yeah. And the fact that he sees these beautiful layers uh, and he's able to, to relate them to these stones. Uh, you know, it's one of those things I'm thinking, uh, whatever the material is, it's very special. And if it's these stones, fine. If it's something that looks like these stones, fine, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. It doesn't matter to me as long as I'm uh, admitted uh, I'll be very happy with uh, wherever the Lord puts me. Right. And then... Uh, 20... all, all I ask is if, if I'm on the top floor, is it, there's an elevator. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you have weeds, Charlie. <laughs> right. So the meek will inherit the earth, but I don't know about the lazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, when, I, when I was at the, my, in college, I had a my dorm was on the fourth floor, and, uh, and it was amazing how many times I was, went up and down those stairs. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. But you were more fit, and uh, that was good. In <laughs> uh, here in Revelation 21 21, the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each individual gate was one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. Gates of pure uh, of pearl and streets of gold so polished that they're like transparent glass. And well, what about the oysters that uh, those pearls were uh, <laughs> yeah. formed in? Giant ones. Oysters, yeah, those are, it's, it's that sea that there's no more of that. The oysters that big are forming in, I guess. Yes, that's right. Again, what what Paul's uh, John is seeing something that how do you explain it to people, right? Yeah, good point. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. He's he's done his best to be able to describe it to us. Uh, I mean that that's fantastic when you when you think about what he's describing. I mean that, that uh, they're yeah. not the norm, they're not the normal gates. No, definitely not. Yeah, and, and normally when we say show us your pearly whites, we're not talking about <laughs> gates. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Uh, but I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. So there's no, there's not going to be a temple in the city, and God the Father and God the Son replace the temple. The temple was a place of sacrifice, and Jesus completed this duty. The temple holy of holies was where God resided behind the curtain, remember? But the curtain was torn in two when Jesus took his last breath on the cross. And the temple was a place of rituals and worship. But we live in the city with the one we worship. So a temple is no longer needed. Makes sense to me. And here in Revelation 21, 23. Well, you know, if we, if we look back when we talk about that shape of the New Jerusalem, it's the shape of the, of the most holy place. And the most holy oh. place had the characteristic of the place where God dwelt. So... In actuality, it's not that we don't have a need of a temple anymore. We are actually in the temple in the of temple. God. Yeah, good point. The sacrificial Jeff. system isn't happening anymore, but we're living with God in the temple with him. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Revelation 21, 23, and the city had no need for sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminates it. The Lamb is its light. And then here in Isaiah 30, 26, Isaiah says, the moon will shine like the sun and the sunlight will be seven times brighter like the light of seven full days when uh, the Lord binds up the bruises of his people and heals the wounds he inflicted. Charlie? Oh, yeah. I was just thinking this, it's the seven here is, uh, of course, one of our, one of the magic numbers we, we, we think about. I and mean, this is, this is a, again, a godly perfection, right? Yeah. That's right. uh, the light, the light here is not, is not the light we're used to. 
<laughs> oh. You know, because, yeah, when we, when we think of seven times brighter or seven times, uh, full, yeah, put seven days worth of sun in one day, we're thinking I don't have enough sunscreen for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. We won't have to worry about that anymore. But this is this is a heavenly thing. It's a it's a heavenly light. And, you know, I, I'm thinking that this is I'm going to really jump out of the limb here. I hadn't thought about this much, but I'm thinking, wow, this is telling us that as far as any evil, evil hidden anywhere, it won't have any place because it can't be it can't exist here. Right. There's no dark place for evil That's right. to grow. No it's just place not going to happen that. again. Yes, yeah. <laughs> you know, it sin is dead and will not grow again. I, I that's what I'm hearing out of this. Yeah, very good. I I hadn't thought of that in in that way, but I agree, Charlie. So Jesus is the light that replaces the sun, but the prophet speaks uh, that there will be a moon. So will there be both night and day in the city? And Eddie, I think you mentioned last night that it says uh, there's no need for sun or moon to shine in shine in it but perhaps there's still a sun and a moon i don't know yeah yeah there's indications that uh, like i mentioned before that uh, we'll have a days you know uh, i don't know if there's going to be sunrises maybe it's just daytime all the time and maybe we don't rest uh, but there is a cycle because isaiah says that from one new moon to another and from one sabbath to another shall all flesh come worship before me so that there seems to be some kind of uh measurement of weekly cycle times monthly and you know that sort of, and weekly that sort of thing yeah good it's, who knows <laughs> what's that i who said knows? who knows we'll get yeah, to probably right. be surprised we look forward to uh answering that question yeah and uh who would like to read here with uh, the 24 through 27 uh, I'll, I'll be happy to. Okay, thanks, John. And the nations of those who are saved shall work in its light. Walk. Excuse me. Well, work, walk. Okay. walk. <laughs> <laughs> Let me get this right. I don't know what was wrong with me. Uh, and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. Yeah. And that's that seven times brighter light, right? Yeah. Right. And yeah. the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. And I'm thinking, what glory do they have in comparison to him? But OK. Yeah. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. And here's the parenthetical question, which yeah. we scratch our head with. There yeah. shall be no night there. Yeah. And, that's right. And they shall bring glory, the glory and the honor of the nations into it. But there shall by no means enter into it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie. And only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But only those. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah so that, that goes, you know, that, it, it follows right what we were talking about earlier, right? God's light is so intense in, in, in love and in, intense in truth and honesty that evil cannot grow there. And yeah. in fact, can't even walk in. As we know, you know, we talk about God being a consuming fire and this is this is one point of it, right? If, if evil did go in, it would be like walking into a lake of fire for the evil. Yeah, that's right. There's no place, there's no place for evil. So what can I add? It's, it's a city of peace. I mean, mm -hmm. Only those saved by the blood of Christ will reside here, it says it. And Nothing praise God for that, right? It praise Amen. God for the blood of Christ <laughs> and his promises that he's, I mean, this is the, the opening words in Genesis are all about creating humanity, right? And then man falls or humans fall. And so this love relationship that God has engendered back then with, with his human beings he loved so much has gone through the cycle where he's chased after them. The lovers were separated. He's chased after them through the rest of the Bible. And then in, here we see in Revelation 21, ah, they're back together again. The lovers are back together. Yeah. And this time they do ride off into the sunset that doesn't set. Uh, <laughs> yeah, good point. <laughs> and you know, nothing that defiles could ever enter the city. And 
Only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life can enter. Safe and secure in the presence of God and His Son with the saints, what more could we ask for? And I will go and prepare a place for you, Jesus said. And uh, here's our summary. So the new Jerusalem has, arrives on earth. Of course, the new heaven, God creates new heavens and new earth first. And then the new Jerusalem arrives. And we get to take possession of our inheritance from the Father. And of course, only those written in the Lamb's Book of Life can ever enter there. The Father and the Son live in this holy city. And there's no need for sun anymore. Jesus is the light. So the city's beauty was described and was amazing to me. And that ends Revelation 21. And the Lamb wins. And now we have to look at Revelation 22 for a moment. And uh, Charlie's going to be doing that next week, I believe. Yeah. I don't think it's really a, a long, long chapter, as I recall. Yeah. Uh, I do think we'll have some time to sort of reflect on our study for, uh, from Daniel's Revelation as we, as we conclude our study of 22. I'm hoping that's the case. Right. Any, any comments, any questions? No, what a glorious day that will be. You know, I was thinking about that. Uh, I was trying to let my mind just go on how John described the new Jerusalem and those 12 foundations with all those precious pearls, precious uh, uh, stones yeah. and pearls and the gold and all that. You know, he had to have known those to write those down. So uh -huh. he was familiar with... Uh, with uh, those stones. And I thought, you know, this is uh, going to be an incredibly beautiful place. Not a, not a gaudy place, but a, just a beautiful with colors and lights and, and there's no darkness. I mean, that is something about just being in the light that makes you feel good, you know? Yeah. Amen. So, so everything that's, that will, it'll, it'll be well worth uh, the price. Yeah. Can't wait. Yeah. All right. Anyone, uh, any other comments before we close for this evening? No, well, we have a closing prayer um, and then we'll look forward to our last study next week. Sounds well, good. And everyone have a, a, a good time to reflect upon all the good things God has done for us. Amen. Give yes. thanks. Yeah, give thanks. Eddie, would you like to close us? Okay, sure. Our our great God, um, we stand amazed, and surely eyes not seen nor ear heard the things that uh, you have prepared for those that love you. Lord, keep us safe uh, in your arm. I know that you would. You do. You've done everything to see that we can be partakers of this wonderful plan that you have for all of us. Lord, our heart's burden is for those that do not know you, uh, that are destined for the lake of fire. Uh, Lord, if you would hear our prayers for our families, may there not be one, one person uh, in our families that is absent uh, from uh, that great reunion supper in the new Jerusalem. Not one person that will be absent from the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, this is our prayer, Lord, and I pray that you would uh, hear uh, according to your will and your great plan. We know you love them more than even we do. So we give them to you, Lord, and we're not afraid. Uh, we, we have no fear because we know that you've heard our prayer in the name of Jesus and that your will will be done and that you will do everything uh, that is possible to draw them to you. Thank you for Larry and Lori and uh, Charlie. Uh, give them rest, but give their families rest and peace. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Eddie. And, All uh, right, thank guys. Thank for joining us. Yeah, Lori. Yeah. Okay. It's a good, good study. Yeah. yeah. Very good, Larry. Thank I'm you. Hoping, I'm hoping for uh, yeah, one, one will go out with a bang with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so oh, we're on that path. That's yes. Awesome. You guys have a great Thanksgiving. Love yeah, you, you too. All have right. Good time with your family. Okay. With family. Thank, Thank you. you.
All right. Good night. Good night.